Hello again, and welcome to part seven of the series of talks on introduction to philosophy. Uh, this is the last one of three problems, and it concerns the goals of our knowledge. What is knowledge for? We've already looked at rationalism versus empiricism, then analytic and synthetic propositions. And now we're asking the question, what is knowledge for? <clears throat> Should we seek something like certainty? Or should we rest content with something uh, a little more modest, such as, for example, error reduction, learning to make uh, fewer mistakes as time goes on? Can we, need we attain certainty about what we claim to know, or can we rest content with just making fewer errors? And the battle lines are drawn. Uh, as you might well have guessed at this point, Plato is going to be on the side of certainty. Because recall for Plato, what, come, what we know is not sensation or appearance, not the shadows in the twilight world of the cave, but what we know is real ideas, capital R, capital I. These things are eternal, they are perfect. And thus, if we know them, we must know them with some, something uh, resembling at least certainty. René Descartes, perhaps also surprise, surprise. The only things we should dignify with the term knowledge are what he calls clear and distinct ideas, these are always going to come with analytic certainty. On the other side of the ledger, <clears throat> um, a little far, a little older than, than, than Plato, uh, comes Socrates. All men are ignorant, says Socrates, I, Socrates included. Most of us are ignorant about most things. And the best we can hope for is to become a little less ignorant about some things. In the 20th century, Karl Popper sees Socrates and as we'll see, raises him um, the more ideas, says Papa, we can show to be false, the more our knowledge grows. So as ignorance shrinks, we approach ever closer to truth. Never quite get there, capital T, but closer and closer. This is a notion Papa calls verisimilitude. We'll explore that a little later on. But let's start with this story. We're going to read this when we read uh, Plato's Apology, that is his account of, of Socrates' defense at, uh, at Socrates' trial. And... <clears throat> Socrates tells a story about the Delphic Oracle. One of their friends, Herophon, who's now at the time of the trial, is, is, is dead. Uh, Herophon, as you know, <clears throat> was very impetuous in all his doings. And he went to Delphi and boldly asked the Oracle to tell him whether there was anyone wiser than I was. And the Pythian prophetess answered, there was no man wiser. So the Delphic Oracle pronounced no man wiser than Socrates. Who was the Delphic Oracle? What's an Oracle? Well, an Oracle is a way, first of all, in anthropologically, this is very common as well as very diverse. It's a way of getting an answer from the universe when the universe isn't directly forthcoming. So, for example, uh, the Etruscans um, <clears throat> employed a hierospex, a priest. You would bring him a sacrificial animal, he would get the animal, the guts would spill out, and um, then he would tell, tell you the answer to some questions, maybe your future, maybe your fortune. The Romans uh, adopted this practice from the Etruscans. Among the Zande in East Africa, there's a poison oracle. You ask a chicken a question that can be answered yes or no. Give the chicken some poison. If the chicken lives, the answer is yes. If the chicken dies, the answer is no. And the Pythia, uh, who Socrates mentioned, the, the Pythian prophetess, <clears throat> is really part of an old, old cult, a chthonic cult, as it's called. It goes back to the Pythia, the snake god. Here, here of course, in a medieval drawing, is depicted as a it's a kind of a dragon um, who inhabited a cave at the Omphalos, the navel of the universe, the very center of all creation. And he would, vapors would emerge from his cave. The Pythia would sit on the tripod as you see her here and she would inhale the vapors and then she would speak forth the message. Um, in um, later times, the priests of Apollo, here you can see the, the legend is that Apollo killed the Pythia and took over his cult. The priests of Apollo took over that very same old, old, old Chthonic site and the Pythian prophetess became their oracle. They, uh, they collected the fee. She would, um, she would speak in words that were uninterpretable, perhaps uh, rather like uh, what our contemporary Pentecostals call speaking in tongues. And then the priests of Apollo would interpret and they would collect the fee. This is a depiction <clears throat> of what Delphi would have looked like in the day. It's been excavated now, but, but again, just, just like the Agora in Athens and, and a lot of other sites, um, <clears throat> you don't see buildings like this with roofs on them. You do see um, uh, foundation stones pretty much. But uh, up there at the upper, um, upper right hand, you see the Temple of Apollo. That's now all in ruins. 
And that little column there marked the umphalos where the Pythia did her prophecy. Um, <clears throat> the legend is that Zeus uh, let go two eagles, one from each end of the earth, and where the eagles met would be the center of the universe. That's where they met. And that's the, the navel, navel of uh, everything, the umphalos. And that was where the Pythia operated. So Pythia said, Socrates was the wisest man in all Greece. Now, Socrates doubted this because he didn't think he was wise at all. But then he thought about it because, you know, after all, this is the God that says this and the God can't lie. This is kind of funny if you know what's going to happen to Socrates. He's going to be tried and convicted and put to death, among other things, for a religious offense. Uh, one of his accusers is going to say in open court, Socrates, you're an outright atheist. Uh, Socrates has a little trouble uh, refuting that charge because everybody knows that he believes in lots of gods, like any Greek. In fact, he even has his own personal god, uh, his daemonon. Uh, Demonion, um, but um, he, you know, he, he respected the gods, and he said, "Well, if the gods said this, it must be true." So then, the only question is to figure out in what way is it true. And here's what he came up with: I, Socrates, am ignorant, like everybody else is. The difference is, I, Socrates, know that I'm ignorant, whereas everybody else thinks that they're not. So why was Socrates the wisest man in Greece? We can distinguish here between first order and second order knowledge. First order being our knowledge and second order being our metacognition, if you will, our knowledge of our knowledge um, and, and uh, arrange the prospects in this uh, Punnett square. First order knowledge, either I know or I don't know. Second order, either I know or I don't know. So first possibility uh, is I know and I know that I know or second, I know, but I don't know that I know or third, I don't know, but I know that I don't know or fourth, I don't know and I don't know that I don't know. And if we were to arrange these in the Punnett square, uh, here's what we'd get. Let's take Plato first. When Plato and Aristotle, and Plato, sorry, Plato and Socrates have, have rather different views, as we'll see. <clears throat> Plato thought that we all know deep down his idea of, of anamnesis. Uh, all learning is but recollection. You guys are brilliant. You all, you have it all right here between these two flaps of skin. You just haven't recovered it yet. And the process we call learning is not a process of getting some new knowledge or new information, but it's a process of recalling. Uh, recovered memory syndrome, perhaps, recalling what's already in there. So everybody knows everything already. We just don't know that we know it. And coming to second order knowledge basically amounts to escaping the cave, coming to a realization that you already know what you know. Now you have second order knowledge of your knowledge. You not only know, uh, but you know uh, that you know. If you are in, um, if you're in a doubt about that, then you're still in the cave. Uh, you still know but you just don't know that you do know. Socrates, by contrast, where as well as go back, Plato can fill in uh, segments, uh, property spaces one and two in the Punnett square. For Socrates, property spaces one and two are empty and three and four are the only ones that are populated. Most people uh, are in four. They don't know and they don't know that they don't know. Only Socrates, that's why he's the wisest man, is in property space three, that is, he doesn't know either, but at least he knows second order that he, um, he does know, does not know, sorry. Um, and this is one of the reasons why, why scholars ask, you know, the, the, the question will come to this again when we look at the, the Socratic texts, the Platonic texts about Socrates. Um, to what extent are the views that Socrates puts in Plato, back up, <laughs> the views that Plato puts in Socrates' mouth the actual views of Socrates as opposed to the views of Plato. And this is one of the reasons we think that there's some disjunction there because the point of view that Socrates takes in the Apology very much at odds with the point of view that Plato puts in Socrates' mouth in the Meno Dialogue, the notion of anamnesis. But we'll come back to that. Basically, it's like this. Why is Socrates the wisest man in all Greece? Because in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. And Socrates is the one-eyed man. And the rest of us are just blind. Uh, Noam Chomsky says in contemporary terms, the general population doesn't know what's happening and it doesn't even know that it doesn't even know, doesn't know. Um, lacks metacognition. Uh, most people are in property space for. Earlier Bertrand Russell said of his time, one of the most painful things about our time is that those who feel certainty are stupid and those with any imagination and understanding are filled with doubt and indecision. Am I the only one who thinks that that was not just uh, Bertrand Russell's time? Uh, 
Louis Butler Yeats, the, the best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity slouching toward Bethlehem. Um, one finds this today in the contemporary Democratic Party who end up, as uh, someone has said recently, uh, the average Democrat thinks like a social worker instead of like a Bolshevik. Um, they want to speak truth to power, uh, as Mark Willis says, when they should be wanting to seize power. Liberals, are you tired of the lies, fed up with the fear-mongering, the demagoguery, the glorification of ignorance? Are you ready, liberals, to do battle with the armies of darkness? Are you mad as hell? Not mad, really, just disappointed. Yes, but concerned and deeply saddened. Hey, does anybody need a hug? Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll jump ahead there. Um, has anybody heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect? Um, even if you've not heard of it, I bet you've come across it. It's very common. The Dunning-Kruger effect is when the unskilled and the incompetent falsely believe in their own superiority, the skilled and learned are more circumspect about their own abilities and so tend to underrate them. That's what Russell, I think, and Yates were talking about. The unskilled and incompetent lack what we can call metacognitive ability, that is they lack second order knowledge about the state of their knowledge. And this is what Socrates was getting at. If you know the Dilbert cartoon, Dilbert comes up to a secretary and uh, she says to him, the boss, um, you should build your own helicopter from a kit. I'll send you a link to the website. It's only dangerous for people who are too dumb to know how dumb they are. Ooh, it's as easy as it sounds. I have pliers, yes. Here's John Cleese. Uh, and the Dunning Kruger effect, John Cleese for Money In order to know how good you are at something it requires exactly the same skills as it does to be good at that thing in the first place, which means, this is terribly funny, that if you're absolutely no good at something at all, then you lack exactly the skills that you need to know that you're absolutely no good at it. Yes. It's like when you're dead. When you're dead, you don't know you're dead, but it's hard for the people around you. And it's the same if you're stupid. Um, Voltaire made an interesting comment about someone once. Uh, he said of that person, that man must be very ignorant. <laughs> he answers every question he has asked. Hmm? Know anybody like that? Hmm? Every time you ask a question, they have an answer. Mr. Know-it-all. Well, that's not a compliment, is it? It is rather the hallmark of an educated person that they will say, I don't know. And as you become more and more educated men and women, you will find yourself say more and more often, someone asks a question, gee, you know, that's, that's a little beyond my, my depth. Um, I, my knowledge drops off here. I don't have an answer to your question off the top of my head, but maybe we could figure it out. However, at the moment, I kind of draw a blank. And, you know, that's some, if honestly said, that's not a bad thing. The more you learn, the more you realize that there are things to learn. And the more problems you solve, the more problems you create. Um, maybe you've had this experience uh, in my class. Uh, I don't ask you to write term papers, but let's say you've probably done this and, and will certainly do it in the future. Um, you decide on a topic for a term paper. So you go to your prof and you say, this is what I'd like to do. He says, fine, signs off on it. And you go to the library and you start building a reading list, first thing you do. And as you build a reading list, you realize, oh my God, in order to answer this question, I have to have the answer to some prior questions. So your reading list just metastasizes. And, and you go back to your professor and you say, uh, can I please narrow this down a little bit? And he usually says, yes, signs off on it. Um, the more you read, the more you realize you have to have read something before in order to comprehend what you're reading now. It's uh, potentially an infinite problem. But let me, um, let me simplify the problem by using a metaphor. And metaphor is genealogy. Has anyone ever done their family tree? Um, it's, um, it's an interesting thing to do. And we live now in the golden age of genealogy. Uh, resources that one would have to travel you know, miles and halfway around the world to archives to get in the recent past uh, are now available at your fingertips online. For example, the entire US census. And if you or whoever you're looking for was born in America, uh, was, was living in America, let's say in 1940, the census is released 72 years after the census is taken. So the last one we have is 1940. In, in uh, 2022, we're gonna get the 1950 census. But if you can find somebody in the 1940s census, what I usually tell my students when I take them through an exercise like this, if you're willing to spend an entire Saturday uh, doing this, you can probably get on at least one ancestral line 
back to the Civil War or back to the point at which that ancestor immigrated. In fact, comes later than the Civil War. Uh, it's um, there's no guarantees, but it's remarkably easy to do with the U.S. Census. That's, that's a main main source for um, for American genealogy, at least. Okay, so here's how it works. Um, you start with what you know, and you proceed to what you don't know. Now that sounds like a bromide, but you'd be surprised how many people say, "Oh, you know, I have a I have a famous I have, I have an ancestor my my." Uh, uh, family tree named Hopkins, and there was a famous guy named Hopkins who signed the Declaration of Independence um, from the, the state of, I think it was Connecticut, was it? Um, uh, and, uh, and I'm probably related to him. No, no, no. You, you're spinning your wheels. Start with what you know. Yourself, obviously. Your parents, I hope. Grandparents, I hope. Um, talk to your grandparents. Aunts and uncles are important, too. It's not just the direct lines. Look at family Bibles if you have them. You know, whatever you have, get it together before you ever, you know, start doing novel research and what you're going to aim to do uh, with whatever information you have however far you can get from the outset is to construct a tree that looks like this and you can see the tree is numbered it's a binary tree uh, so number one is you always number two is your father number three is your mother and for thereafter male ancestors are even numbers female ancestors are odd numbers so you see number two is my father number four is his father but number five an odd number is his mother and so you go, and that's that's what you, you, you attempt to do. And there are now um, computer programs, and they, they all work the same, so it doesn't really matter which one you get, that will allow you to construct this family tree. In the old days, you know, if you did it on a sheet of paper, you'd run out of stuff, and you'd have to curl, you know, sentences around here, whatever. But you can go 20, 30 generations if you can get that far back. Most people can't, but the program will, will accommodate that, so you can follow the tree back and forth, up and down, you know, wherever you want to go. It's easier to do. Okay, so let's say hypothetically that I'm starting out and all I know is myself and my mom. So here I am, I'm Michael, she's Lorraine. I don't know who her parents are. So I wanna find out. First thing I'm gonna ask is who was her father? So I dig through the appropriate records and I discover, ah, here he is. Her father was Wilhelm. Well, good, now I've solved my problem. I've, I've filled in space number six, but what have I done? I've now opened up the question, which I didn't have before, what happens to uh, the other spaces beyond number six? I've, I've changed the numbers, but basically numbers, uh, numbers 12 and 13, uh, his parents. Um, well, now I've got two more problems to solve. So it's kind of like whack-a-mole. Every time, you know, you hit something, something else pops up, or the Hercules and the Hydra. And genealogy is really only just a special instance of the general problem I'm talking about, because there's always a fixed exponential of two to one. There isn't that in, in, in other real life problems. Um, and there's no limit to the ratio of problems generated for every problem solved. So here's a, here's, I like this picture. This is a cover of a book of a friend of mine. Um, there's a maze and you go through the maze and you get out and oh my God, then now there's a couple more mazes waiting you. And once you get through those mazes, many, many more mazes, it just keeps on going. Well, should this observation produce a council of despair? Why study? The more I study, the more I know, the more I know, the more I forget, the more I forget, the less I know. So why study? Hmm. Well, that was what Socrates take from it. Socrates had a rather a different take. Hey, ignoramus, you. When Socrates says that, he is not dissing you. His point is that we are all ignorant. I, Socrates, included in that. This is not an insult. This is merely a statement of the human condition. Ignorance is not the same thing as stupidity. It's just lack of information. If I'm ignorant and I discover that I am, then I can correct it. If I have the opportunity to correct it and then refuse that opportunity, maybe that's verging upon stupidity, but ignorance itself is not uh, stupidity. Um, we're going to correct our ignorance, I hope. We're never going to make it perfect. Um, but the more I shrink my ignorance, the better I become. So for Socrates, um, we're always going to be in the dark about lots of things. We can be in the dark about fewer things. There are worse things than being intellectually mistaken. There are worse things than being ignorant. The more ignorance I shed, the better off I am. Popper comes along in the 20th century and says essentially the same thing, but with a twist. Our knowledge, says Popper, can only be finite, while our ignorance must necessarily be infinite. So Popper agrees with Socrates. Considerable knowledge coexists with considerable ignorance. We make many mistakes. Indeed, the process of gaining knowledge is a process full of error because it's a process of trial and error. But to the extent we can correct our errors and shrink our ignorance, to that extent we do become better. 
Now, if this was all that Popper was saying, ho hum, just repeating what Socrates said, but it isn't. Popper goes on to develop a specific model of how science grows, and this is a good uh, metaphor also for how knowledge grows in general. Um, precisely because, and in proportion to the fact that we discover more and more just what sorts of propositions are false and we learn to reject them. Now, this is not the conventional view of science that most people hold. This is a very unconventional view. Here is the conventional view. This is from a contemporary uh, uh, drug company commercial uh, during the current pandemic. Let's give it a watch. At a time when things are most uncertain, we turn to the most certain thing there is. Science. Yes, the most certain thing there is, science. Edit. Um, Georges Canguillem, a French philosopher of science, put it starkly. Science, he says, is a contemplative possession of reality through exclusion of all illusion, error, and ignorance. Popper disagrees. For Popper, rather, it's not the exclusion of all illusion, error, and ignorance. It is a process of trial and error that involves trial, but it also involves error. Um, possession of reality, exclusion of all illusion, error, and ignorance, that's Canguillem's view. That's close to the conventional view. But Popper dismisses this. Popper disagrees that science excludes all error and ignorance. He also denies that science is some, quote, possession of reality, unquote. Science, rather, is a process of progressive error elimination, need, leading nonetheless to a progressive approximation to truth. It's progressive, but it's an approximation. So progressive approximation to reality, exclusion of some error and ignorance, but never completely all of it. For Popper, science is a negative, eliminative, reductive process. He calls it conjectures and refutations. Conjectures are guesses. Refutations are attempts to shoot those guesses down. Scientists don't proceed by confirmation, this is one of his major points, or verification, but rather by falsification in a process, again, of trial and error. Now, when we say falsification, don't get confused here. It doesn't mean that when we say uh, scientists falsify their hypotheses, that they are falsifying data or, or, or lying or not telling the truth, none of that kind of stuff. It means disproving rather than proving propositions, basically. That's what falsification tends to get at. So, what scientists do, according to Popper, is this. Rather than trying to prove theories by piling up positive examples, positive observations to prove the truth of the hypotheses that are derived uh, deductively from those theories, scientists rather do something else. They search for counterexamples. They search for negative instances, which are going to shoot down the theories and show them to be false. And they may or may not succeed in doing this, but this is the attempt that they make. So, for example, Take the theory, all swans are white. Uh, this isn't just gratuitously chosen. This was indeed a theory. It was a standard textbook example in the 19th century of how theories get built up by inductive reasoning. Um, you see a swan, oh, it's white. You turn the coin, you see another swan, oh, it's white. Now, you can't just say, you know, I've seen two swans, therefore all swans are white, you know. Uh, my first wife was a bitch, my second wife was a bitch, therefore all women are bitches. No, you gotta have a large sample size, but let's say you have hundreds of swans. Every time you turn the corner and see a swan, it's white. So inductively, so goes the story. You draw the generalization and are justified. In so doing, all swans are white. From a small, at least a finite number of examples, you make a, 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 a universal generalization and qualify. And that was supposedly what scientists do. This was the textbook example of that. Let's have a look at uh, what Popper says. Uh, here we have uh, one of those uh, great little videos from BBC Four. This is Aidan Turner, the actor. You might think that scientists begin with hypotheses such as all swans are white and then go about looking for evidence to support them. Karl Popper disagreed. He suggested that scientists do indeed begin with hypotheses bold hypotheses that can be falsified by evidence. But rather than looking for supporting evidence, Popper argued scientists go out of their way to refute their own hypotheses, testing them to destruction. They go out searching for black swans, not more white swans. Science is all about falsification, not confirmation. It's a series of conjectures and refutations. And of course, Aidan Turner played Sherlock Holmes, so it's kind of like Sherlock Holmes. Uh, eliminated all other factors, and the one which remains must be the truth. 
So theories are conjectures, guesses, uh, that can be shown to be false. That's important. It's possible to, it's possible to state a theory in such a way that no possible evidence would, uh, would falsify it. Um, you know, you're, you're behaving as you do because your unconscious uh, drives you, but I'm not conscious of it. I, I deny that that's the case. Well, then you're in denial. And it's a kind of a caricature of a Freudian argument. Uh, uh, sorry, by the way, the popper um, had uh, no time at all for, uh, but that's what he had in mind. Uh, if you can state something in such a way that no possible observations would ever show it to be false, then what you're saying is just empty. Have a piece of lettuce, go on, goodbye. Um, having been refuted though, if they are falsifiable, they can then be rejected. The entire point of this whole process is to find and eliminate falsehood, find and eliminate error. Popper points out that when we do this, when we test generalizations, such as hypotheses derived from a theory, for example, there's a serious asymmetry. And that asymmetry lies between proof and disproof. Hmm? The asymmetry is this, it is impossible to prove a generalization true. Hmm? No matter how many positive observations confirm it, right around the corner, there might be that one disconfirming observation counterexample, and how many does it take? One and only one. Uh, Turner mentioned the, the black swans actually got refuted the white swan theory. Swans in England happen to be white. That's where people were generalizing from. Swans in Australia are black. And you can see this, you go to any zoo today, Los Angeles Zoo is an example. You'll see black swans, you'll see white swans. They are the same species, so they mate. So you'll see Dalmatian swans, you'll see black on the top, white on the bottom swans, white on the top, black on the bottom swans. You know, uh, not all swans are white. But it only took that first black swan in Australia to do the trick. So it's impossible to prove a generalization true. It's very easy, however, to prove a generalization false. All it takes is that one disconfirming observation, that dreaded counter example, as it's called. I'll tell you a little shaggy dog story here to this point. John Austin, we came across John Austin, if you uh, did the little sidebar on, on um, uh, language philosophy. Um, he was a language philosopher. Spoiler alert. And Austin was scheduled to read a paper before a conference of fellow philosophers. This is the way academics work. It's not just scientists, it's, it's all disciplines that do this. Um, usually a professional association at the national, sometimes international level, sometimes even state level, usually meets once a year in some city or other. And um, people buy to have papers accepted for presentation. If the paper gets accepted, they'll have maybe an hour to read the paper and then maybe an hour to entertain criticisms. And um, the other people in the audience will do exactly what Popper is talking about. They will try to shoot it down. But if the paper runs that gauntlet and survives the criticism, maybe that's a good sign. Maybe it means that this paper is worthy of being submitted to an academic journal, peer reviewed journal, which is how the knowledge gets produced. And, um, and that's, uh, you know, that's, that's always a start. So here's Austin, he's got the opportunity to read his paper, then he will respond to criticisms. He's got, you know, some considerable time to do this. And he starts his paper this way. We know of some languages in which the double negative is a positive. We know of some languages in which the double negative is a negative. What does he mean by that? Well, um, take English, for example. If I say to you, I ain't not gonna do that, what have I just said? Well my knots have canceled each other out. I, I, I said, in effect, I'm going to do that, which is the opposite of what I seem to intend to say. And the examples don't have to be ignorant, you know, uh, misuse of, 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 of the English language. Uh, I, can, I can use uh, irony, for example, I can say to you, well, I am not unaware of what you're trying to tell me. What do I mean by that? Well, I am certainly aware of what you're trying to tell me, okay? That's a little more grammatical usage, but it's the same point. In the English language, negatives cancel each other out. That's the rule there. Not all languages have the same rules though, uh, which is why uh, translation is, is difficult. You know, If you go to a country where the language is foreign and you try to order from a menu, you'll take your dictionary and go, hmm, this word corresponds with it. And it, usually that works for vocabulary, but not for everything. In the Greek language, for example, if you use a uh, double negative, the effect is not for the negatives to cancel one another as it does in English, but to intensify the negation. So if I said to you, uk est, uk is not, est is, is, is the word order is reversed from, from English, uh, I'm saying it is not. And if I say uk, uk est, I'm saying it really is not. And if I say uk, 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 uk est, it really bloody well certainly never is the case that, that is. So what I'm doing 
by doubling and indeed multiplying negation. So I am not canceling the negation, but I am intensifying the negation. So again, different languages have different rules. English has the rule, the double negative is positive. Greek, for example, has the rule, the double negative is a negative, the multiple negative is negative. So, and then he goes on, he says, I know of no languages in which the double positive is a negative. Okay, now, here's his main thesis. He's gonna finish reading the paper, uh, giving some, some reasons for that, and then he's going to have time for questions. Whereupon, in the back of the room, the smart alky American philosopher, Sidney Morgan Besser, stands up, folds his arms, and says, yeah, yeah. And there's this moment of silence, and then everybody rolls in the aisles. What has Morgan Besser just done? He's just provided a counterexample. How many does it take? One. Here's poor Austin. This is a famous story. <laughs> Nobody wants to be in this position, but yeah, Austin's got nothing to say for the rest of the time. Shot out of the water. The dreaded counterexample. So for any perfect general generalization, how many counterexamples are required to show that this generalization is definitively false? That's the question. And the answer is no more than one, at least one. Again, that asymmetry. It is impossible to prove a generalization true. It is very easy, as you see, to prove a generalization false. And so Popper goes on from that. So all these white swans hanging around England, I find that one black swan, that's all it takes. It is not the case that all swans are white. Simply provide one counterexample in the form of a non-white swan, and the theory of all swans are white is now falsified, and is and is it is definitively falsified. So, falsehood is within our grasp. Truth, though, is rather elusive. Science, Popper says, is a social process of conjecture and refutation. Hypotheses are guesses; they're conjectures. We send them up like trial balloons, and then people try to shoot them down. Fellow scientists and most of them do get shot down. This is a collective process. Ideas and hypotheses run the gauntlet. It's like this guy here trying to get through uh, intact. Uh, opponents trying to destroy them. That's what happens with scientific papers, uh, academic papers of all sorts in the process of peer review. You know? Got to run the gauntlet. So trial and error is going to uncover much error. What did Thomas Edison say? I haven't failed. I've just found a thousand ways that don't work. Okay, good getting closer, right? For Popper, this is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. So, smart alecky kid says to his teacher, so if we learn from our mistakes, shouldn't I try to make as many mistakes as possible? Popper and Socrates would say, yes, that's exactly what you want to do. Make your mistakes early and often. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. The greater the rate of error, the greater the detection of error as error, and therefore the greater possibility we're going to reduce falsehood. Popper takes this insight to build a general theory of human knowledge. Paradoxically, this is a paradox for common sense, knowledge grows positively to the extent that negatively we can eliminate possibilities. I like this drawing here. I cribbed it from conversations with a friend a long time ago. Um, here's Popper's model of knowledge growth. Okay, we have um, a timeline, T1, T2, Tn, and we have a series of boxes with circles and the circles get smaller as the timeline goes. The, the circle is labeled PT, possibly true ideas. The uh, gray area and the rest of the box labeled F. And you see what happens is in the beginning, the, the population of possibly true ideas is rather large and the population of known falsehoods rather small. But proportionally as time goes on, the circle gets smaller, the gray area gets bigger. There's, there are fewer and fewer things in the population of possibly true ideas, more and more things on the junk heap of obviously known, clearly known falsehoods. And this is, this is the way uh, science works for, for Popper. Um, so there was a time in the past when we could entertain ideas, so as educated people could entertain ideas seriously, like the logistum, the flat earth theory, skin shifting, we talked about that earlier, uh, the geocentric theory, uh, alchemy, spontaneous generation of life, luminiferous ether, etc. They were all within the circle of PT. And now they've all been kicked out onto the scrap heap of F. And the circle of things which are possibly true are a circle that contains a much smaller population. So what Popper is proposing here is a highly counterintuitive model of mind and knowledge. And it's one which flies in the face of what previously had been the received wisdom. Think back to John Locke 
and his tabula rasa, his blank slate. Popper likes the metaphor of a bucket. He calls this the bucket theory of knowledge. Um, on the blank slate, you accumulate a lot of writing facts, 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 facts information, information, information. The, the fuller your slate gets, the more knowledge you have, direct proportion. Uh, in Popper's bucket, the more facts you put in the bucket, the more knowledge you have. The metaphors work e equally well. In either case, knowledge is, would be, directly proportional to information accumulated. But on Popper's view, knowledge is inversely, not directly proportional to information accumulated. The more information we can reject as false, well, the, the stronger our knowledge is, the more knowledge we gain. So Popper proposes also an equally counterintuitive notion of truth, what he calls vera similitude. Just look at the word, vera from truth, similitude from similarity, uh, something which, is, which approximates the truth, which is similar to the truth. So Popper would have to disagree with Ken Graham's view we looked at earlier, that, that science excludes all error and ignorance. It only excludes some of it. He also denies that science, he, Popper, also denies that science is some, quote, possession of reality, unquote, as Ken Graham would say. Um, error elimination, a reductive process, does not get us truth. It gets us however closer. And that's not nothing. So. Verisimilitude. We know pretty clearly what's not true. Falsehood is within our grasp. We never know quite so clearly what is true. Truth is elusive. Truth is at best probable, never certain. And when we say that something is true, we mean it's not yet false. Just like when we say that something is scientifically established, we mean that so far to the best of our knowledge, this is our best guess to date, subject to what might come around the corner tomorrow. But we don't know. But we get an approximation to truth, and this approximation grows. It's progressive. So verisimilitude is a compromise view, um, just like error reduction generally is a compromise view. If you can't get complete certainty, settle. Well, um, there are some people that say, don't settle. Um, but uh, verisimilitude says settle. Let's assume that certainty is a good when you can get it. And you can, in some cases, one plus one always is two. It's just certain analytic propositions are like that. But if you can't get it, do you want to throw the baby out with the bathwater? Um, I think someone like Popper would look at someone like Descartes and say that's exactly what he tries to do. Um, when we reject various possibilities as false, things like spontaneous generation of life, you know, um, meat produces flies, that sort of thing, um, geocentricity, alchemy, skin shifting, uh, when we reject these things, we don't get certain truth in their place. We get closer to truth uh, in proportion as we discover that these kinds of things are false. Even if we cannot ever get to certain truth, capital C, capital T, we can get relatively closer to relatively, relatively farther from truth. It's better to get closer. And that is not nothing. That's Popper's message. So, for example, we really do know that water is a compound. It's composed of elements. We know what those elements are. We used to think water was an element. Now we know better, and more precisely, better. Biological inheritance is transmitted by a chemical information code. We call this DNA. The analytical chemical elements which make up that code have a physical structure in atoms. Atoms, in turn, are divisible into constituent parts. So our science is really quite unified. We know the Earth revolves around the sun. I used to think that. The solar system in which this happens is but one of many, perhaps billions and billions, in a universe which is both finite and expanding. That universe is about 14 billion years old. The solar system itself, about 4.5 billion years old. The animals that we know today do not always exist. Uh, there are many life forms which have become extinct. Others have evolved in the meantime. In particular, the human animal involved, evolved from pre-human ancestors. Babies come from the union of egg and sperm. Of course we know that, right? Except that that basic fact of biology with tremendous implications for our social life didn't come about until 1875. That was when that was first discovered that the sperm and egg unite to produce a conceptus. Now, we know that now uh, it is part of what my friend Derek Price uh, would call packed down science such that during most of our adult lives, most of us assiduously try to avoid that process happening every month. Um, and we know the things that we know uh, because we first discovered what alternative possibilities are not true. Naturally occurring substances like earth, air, fire, and water are not elements. Atoms are not indivisible. Men do not shift skins and become werewolves. Flies are not spontaneously generated from rotting meat. Earth is not flat. It's not the unmoving center of all existence. 
Earth and universe are not 6,000 years old. Animals have not remained unchanged since the creation. Babies don't come from simply planting seeds. Uh, the coagulation of semen and menstrual blood. Um, that was uh, um, Aristotle and many other possible causes from under cabbage leaves, et cetera, which, which we've imagined over the ages. We had to unlearn all that stuff in order to learn what really happens. Um, so let's sum up and I'm summing up now what we've done so far throughout the entire uh, series of lectures to, to this point. The story of philosophy began as the story of all possible human knowledge. I call that P1 philosophy sense one, but there's so much to know. Knowledge has exploded. And as a result of that, philosophy became one more specialized academic discipline among all the others. That's what I call P2, metaphysics, ethics, epistemology. Now thinking is an anthropological universal as far as we detect our species, Homo sapiens, we have thinking creatures, creatures that think abstract thoughts, not just what's for dinner. Philosophy, though, is not an anthropological universal at all. It's rare. It's sometimes not even tolerated. Not even the Greeks tolerated their philosophers in every case. We live in a society in which critical thinking, though, is not only tolerated, it's required. Uh, if you want to graduate uh, with a degree, you need to have a course in critical thinking. That's, that's the extent to which we've gone. Um, Thus, many people get some exposure to philosophy, even if philosophers ourselves are only a tiny minority. Philosophy is a limited taste, difficult to sustain and pursue. Okay, now that all is true. But now, think about this. Suppose philosophy had never existed. Would human life on Earth uh, be any different? I cribbed this from another textbook, uh, from a textbook uh, someone else wrote. Um, the planet unphilosophers. Imagine a planet exactly like Earth, except that philosophy never, uh, never was developed. Well, on this planet, there would be no science, no social science, no humanities, no mathematics. There would be no colleges or universities. There would be no political debate. There would be no critical thought about our mythologies. There would be no criticism or wonder of any sort at all. So yes, even though it's a minority taste, I don't think we can say uh, that the, the tradition we call philosophy has been at all uh, historically socially, culturally negligible. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the historic and, and uh, analytical bits. Uh, what we're gonna do now is shift gears and starting with the next talk, um, we're going to read uh, from the pre-Socratic uh, philosophers. Um, as we'll see, they are fragmentary. And uh, once again, we'll be using, and I'll, 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 um, I'll give you the page numbers when we, when we open that. Uh, we'll be reading from uh, Louis Poyman's book, Classics of Philosophy. Um, in my, my college has a special edition, He's in only the text that we're gonna read. This is drawn in turn from the full second edition. Now the third edition is the latest one, don't get that, but if you can get the second edition, uh, you can probably get it for two bucks online. It's, it's that cheap. Uh, it's perfectly good and it's, got, it's, it's well worth having. It has a bunch of classic texts including the ones we're going to read. After we do the pre-Socratics, we're going to go on to a couple of texts by Plato. We're going to start with um, the Unifro dialogue, then the Minnow dialogue, then the Apology, and the very, very end of the dialogue called Phaedo. After that, we'll look at Descartes' Meditations. We'll do three of the six. Um, we'll go from there to uh, Hegel's Phenomenology, that bit of Hegel's Phenomenology known as the Dialectic of Mastery and Slavery or Lordship and Bondage. So that's it for today. Thank you. Good day, and I will see you next time.